Pranakosha live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt at Pranakasha Productions, and today we are talking with Jacob Mundell, who, if you know The Expanse, you know him as Eric in season five, and you were in four episodes, right? I was in four episodes of season five, that is correct. Right. Hi everybody, hello. After the rock hit, I came up here to watch. The shock waves leveled most of the high rises. Then the seawall at Fells Point went and the whole fucking ocean just ran over the city. And what are you doing here? Please. We're trying to fix the shuttle in that hangar and take it up to Luna. What the fuck? Are we gonna tell everybody on the fucking island what our plans are? He's not wrong. You want my help fixing that ship? We don't leave anyone behind who wants to come. Fine, we'll do it ourselves. Stay here if you want, princess. Timmy's now the registered owner of the ship. There's no hidden kill switches on startup. This operating system is old, but functional. He calls you Peaches. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Why do you call him Timmy? Because that's his name. Should I ask? I wouldn't. Yeah! No, move, move! Eric! Go! Please wait until hangar doors are fully open. Fuck this! He was playing a kind of a gangster dude who was, um, a childhood um, friend of Timmy, who later became Amos, Amos. And uh, mm -hmm. I think actually Eric was uh, instrumental in giving him that new name, right? Yeah, famous Amos um, has been, has has been Amos for four seasons. He is the, that's the name everyone met him with. But uh, I just remember before season five released, there was a teaser commercial released by Amazon that showed just like a flash of me just for a second. Like who is this one handed guy that apparently knows Amos? And, um, and they showed the line where I said, what the fuck are you doing, Timmy? <laughs> and then at the bottom, at the bottom, it read, who's Timmy. So like, like that was a whole big teaser to season fives that they were revealing that. Yeah. Amos's name was Timmy. And of course, if you read the books, if you read Churn, the Churn, then you know the whole backstory of all that stuff that went on and how he became, how he became I, Amos. Yeah, I I read the Churn in my prep for the the job, but I I actually this I don't know. I read Churn, book five, and Oberon before I went to Toronto for episode two, but I actually don't know what order they were released in like i don't know if churn came out before book five or after book five or um that's a good question because i think it's just a side book mm -hmm. with sort of a a tangent so I, it may have actually been written later than the actual timeline that it belonged to we'd have to go back and look but yeah i mean um, someone somebody will fact some fan some viewer will fact check us and put it in the comments i'm sure yeah Fact check away, guys. I was going to ask right off the bat, I mean, how did they do your hand? But I guess so in real life, you really only have one hand. They didn't do my hand. Um, boop, boop, boop. This is a video, right? This is on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, um, two, two to three, like literally like three days ago, I was in L.A. I was uh I was hired because I have one hand and okay. it was, I was a soldier who got his hand blown off. And, um, uh, you know, so, so there's a million people on set and someone from makeup or someone from a different department saw me and was like, oh, wow, that's a great prosthetic. Yeah, I didn't how did they do know, that? <laughs> how did they do? Like they weren't seeing me on screen. They were looking at me 
live in right. person. And, um, and, and I, I, I'm very secure in my identity. I don't, my feelings don't get hurt by people. I'm used to people not knowing what to do when they see me. Right. And I don't, I don't hold that against people, but um, <laughs> he was like, Oh, how did they do that? And I said, this, Oh, this is my body. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he, and he said, uh, he, and I, I don't know, there's no way for me to avoid it, but whenever that right. happens, he was just instantly mortified and he was right. apologizing Super embarrassed. to me. He was apologizing to me five hours later Right. And I'm I'm working on it. I was like, hey, my guy, I promise I don't like it's I understand it's confusing. Like it's confusing and you'd never like please forgive yourself. Please yeah. forgive yourself. I don't hold it that way. Um but yeah, when I when I when season uh five, episode two came out, I was I was getting a lot of I, I was experiencing what I'm used to in my life online which was a lot of people were like um how did, how did they, they do that? that prosthetic that yeah. was it green screen was it this was it that right that's exactly then, what i was going to ask mm -hmm. yeah and then a, and then a lot of people a lot of other fans were doing that super woke super left like liberal like like super um defensive thing coming back hard being like that's his real arm. Don't, don't you dare misunderstand. You are, you're erasing his identity. And I would, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I would chime in every now and then and be like, guys, no, nobody needs to defend me. I don't need defenders. I'm fine. And for everyone who didn't know, yes, this is my body. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> so was, I mean, was that, was it born that way or was that from an injury or how did no, I was okay. This is crazy too. Um, okay. I was I was born this way. Okay, I was, and I and, and for the YouTubers, I don't mind showing. Oh, okay, so, so you have. I got yeah. I got like I got I got little would be fingers. Um, okay, this is all bone, like hat, like a quarter inch under the skin. That is um, forearm bone. So you, if you punch somebody with that, it'd probably be a pretty good weapon. Oh yeah, in middle school, I was a menace. Uh, <laughs> But um, I've actually met, like, not met, but I've, like, seen four or five people in my entire 30-year life uh, who have the exact same, like, it looks the same. It's the same uh -huh. thing. It almost looks kind of like a foot. Well, it tells me that it is it is something that happens. It's not random chaos. It's... Uh -huh. It is a physical thing, but no doctor has ever given me a diagnosis. Um, every doctor I've ever seen has been like, "Yeah, I I got nothing. I, I it's it's one of the one of the beautiful chauses of the world and life." And um, I don't it's the way the DNA I don't know. decided to do its thing. Yeah, and I don't yeah. know what made that happen. But the fact that I have met like four or five other people in my whole life who have the exact same like huh. manifestation tells me it is something. Huh. Now, here's the kicker. Here's what's going to okay. flip you. My mother has one hand from birth, okay. but it doesn't look the same. It doesn't look like this. It's completely different. Interesting. She's missing her right arm. <laughs> no, but like, but it's, uh, it stops at her elbow. Okay. It's way up high at her elbow. And, um, it, it just like the way that the, the, the stopping of the limb occurs. It's, uh, it's just way different. It just looks different. It doesn't look anything like what I have. Okay. So I just, I teeter totter. I go back and forth between it's genetic, it's not genetic, it's a coincidence. It cosmic it, ray just swooped yeah. in right that yeah. moment, you know. And honestly, mm. if I were to investigate it to get a solid answer, I think it would cost money, and I don't care that much. So it's yeah. just gonna it's just gonna live in this space probably for the rest of my life. Well, you can just create a whole mythology around it, mm -hmm. you know. That's really the really interesting thing is um, I I was just at my chiropractor's office 
on Friday, and one of the assistants, um, she's a contortionist, and she can contort herself into all these crazy positions. She used to be like in these circus shows and stuff. But she also um, has one hand that's um, from a birth defect, but it's more like just really small. But she still has enough fingers that she can do some stuff with it, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and of course, it's it's part of her, you know. She's Honestly, yeah. I like, And that's the crazy thing is that disabilities take so many various uh, forms of manifestation that there's um, uh, 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 every disabled person is so different. Um, and I don't, I, I, I don't want to speak to how that does or doesn't compare to other minorities, but I, um, I, it, when I was in high school in Denver, Colorado, I worked for a disabled theater company. I was so lucky that the city I was living in had this company, this theater company that prioritized disabled actors. And um, I never got a chance to meet disabled people, but I got a chance to be a part of this show and everybody else had something going on. There were people with multiple sclerosis. There were people in wheelchairs. There were people, there were other amputees of different degrees and varieties. And um, I honestly, my disability is a little bit of a privilege. I get all of the credit and all of the sympathy of having a disability, but like, besides the fact that my left hand is not there, I am an otherwise six foot two man, <laughs> you know, with, uh, I'm uh, like strong, no, no flexibility problems. I'm, I'm actually very, my disability is almost non-existent, but when I was working for this, um, disabled theater company, family, P-H-A-M-A-L-Y, physically handicapped artists, and musical actors league. <laughs> um, I was driven home sometimes by this other actress who didn't have use of either of her hands. And she unlocked her door with her car key in her teeth. And she, she turned around and she, she dipped her head to the side and she turned, she cranked her car on with, her teeth, and then she put her arms up on the steering wheel. She had a legal license. She wasn't breaking the law, but she fucked. She drove me home. Um, she drove every day in that condition, and I, wow. you know, so I've the disability community is a uh, vast, vast, and literally, I mean, every human being in every minority and every group is different, but in in the world of disability, every individual is literally very unique in how their life takes shape. Wow. Wow. Okay. So now I got to ask, so now we've mm -hmm. learned that you're just a really <laughs> cool, nice guy. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up getting cast as this mean old gangster? It's so, <laughs> it's so fucking funny because I thought when I was doing Eric, okay, I felt like a fraud. Like this is me. Like what you're this conversation we're having. This is who I am. And I the I I'm so bad at like playing the celebrity game the like the try and act interesting game the only uh, way i know how to succeed in having good interactions with people is just to truthfully be yourself un un unapologetically be my loud friendly silly gay self and um, well this is perfect for this show i mean this is that's what everybody wants here we want people to be real well so, and, yeah and I'm healthy, I'm tall, I'm decently in shape. I could play a gangster villain on paper, but like, I don't know, like actual people who are tough, like Wes, Wes Chatham, right. Amos, he was really in the military. Like, Right, he was in the Navy. He actually yeah. knows probably how to kill me or something, you know? And oh, I, yeah, he could snap your neck in a second. And that <laughs> that's, the, that's the point of acting is... Okay. Pretend to do something. So right. I I chose to have confidence in myself and I pretended to play this drug lord 
who is a bad person. Like, right. like Eric, Eric is charming. A lot of people have fallen in love with him as an anti-hero, but we have to remember he is a bad person. He deals right. drugs that cripple whole communities. And he's probably like in the books, he runs uh human trafficking, uh, right. uh, sex work uh, operations. And they don't right. really refer to that in the show, which is probably a good idea. Um, I but, just, okay, so I, you found I, I, yeah. Go ahead. So you had to kind of. I mean, everybody's an actor's got to find some slice of themselves, otherwise it's totally inauthentic. So how did you find? Was there, is there's got to be some part of you that is as nasty as that dude, right? Well, Eric is a little bit gay. He's just a little. He's a little sassy, you know. Okay. He Eric is a little bit sassy. Eric, there's a quote from the book that I walked away with that I that wasn't in the show. Okay. Eric has this quote. He says, um, uh, somebody in the comments will correct me, but it's something along the lines of, I'm not the strongest. I'm never the strongest person in the room, but I'm always the smartest or something like that. Okay. And there is there is a sense with Eric that he knows it's very emasculating, you know? Mm. You know that he, Eric knows he's not going to he's not going to win any kind of a physical competition mm -hmm. with anybody. <laughs> he would Eric would lose a physical competition with a 12 year old, <laughs> you know, like like le, really, truly, um, unless he had a gun. But uh, well, that's the trick. <laughs> that's the trick. <laughs> so it's all about smoke and mirrors i think honestly it's about being smart enough to prepare okay. and have muscle and then half of it is smoke and mirrors and right. um and I influence could, of course influence. So he, knew how to, he knew who to make alliances with and who to backstab and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff money paid muscle right I know they're not going to turn on me. I'm going to, they won't get paid unless they make sure I live, <laughs> you know? Um, right. So. The thing that, so I get that, that, I mean, you played the role great. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how did you land that role? Like, how did you, uh, they decide to, to cast yeah. you as a potential person to play that part? A lot of people ask me that, and I wish I had a super interesting story, but I guess it, 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 it's informative to tell you. It was a very boilerplate industry standard situation. Um, so I want to give Amazon and the Expanse people, Breck, Eisner, Ty Frank, like mm -hmm. uh, I want to give everyone in the leadership of the Expanse credit because they told me privately at a, at a cast party, we'd all had a little bit of drinks. And um, Breck Eisner said to me, we had this option between us. We realized we could go with an accomplished, surefire, big name actor with two hands and just green screen it. We had the money. We could have done that. We could have just special effects affected in a talent okay. um but we decided before we do that we will exert a lot of money time and effort to a certain point of termination into doing a national search for talent so they they in acting in the world of auditioning it's called a breakdown they send a breakdown out to agents they send a mm -hmm. breakdown out to agents normally i guess most of the acting industry is in la and new york so that's where a lot of the breakdowns go to but okay if you're a special interest special talent actor like me in chicago you have yeah. the privilege of not having to be in the hottest markets. I can be in the second hottest market, which is Chicago. Okay. Chicago gets passed over for some of the leading roles, stuff like that. But, you know, after if if a if a casting department can't find what they want in New York, LA, they go to Chicago. Okay. Uh, 
And so, so my, and my the crazy I, thing, of course, is that the, the show's shot in Toronto. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So, but they're still looking for. That. Well, so yeah. Well, and that's another form of privilege. I mean, a, a, a lot of America is becoming so outrageously expensive that a lot of shows are no longer. A lot of expensive shows, instead of shooting in L.A. Um, are shooting in Toronto, where the Canadian dollar is about eighty cents to the American dollar, and they can do they can hire all of their day players, co stars, maybe even a guest star or two from Canada, pay the Canadian union rates, mm-hmm. which are and the Canadian Actors Union, it's the Canadian version of SAG. Mm-hmm is not quite as strong as SAG. I'm a member of SAG-AFTRA mm-hmm. and I noticed it. I noticed it when I was there. There were like three Americans, me, Nadine and Wes. Mm-hmm. And the Teamsters, everyone, they had to be a little bit nicer to us than they had to be to the Canadian actors just be- because the Canadian, the Canadian Actors Guild is not quite as powerful and it's not quite it can't make as many demands of the studios to okay you know pay and respect the actors um but to finish off the auditioning story real quick uh um so the they they sent the breakdown to my agent my agent is gray talent group in um chicago shout out gray talent group thank you for everything you guys are doing for me and um They sent me the audition. I spent about four days preparing that first scene, the first scene in season five, episode two. Okay. Um, I prepared that, ran it over and over. I was buying groceries and running the lines in my head. And then I, this is pre COVID when you would still audition in person at your agent's studio. And I, I went to my agent's office and I, they recorded the tape, sent it off to Toronto Two days later, I got a call back. I went back to my agent's office. I redid the scene in a live Zoom audition with Breck Eisner in uh, Toronto. And then two days later, they said, you got it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, So you didn't actually audition with Wes there? No, I didn't okay. meet Wes until we were rehearsing for it until I had the job. Oh, okay. I, I don't, I mean, obviously Wes is a very central, important character. I don't think they would ever consult him on who to hire. Like that's not his. Yeah. I mean, purview. like sometimes they try to figure out chemistry between two actors and stuff like that. Yeah. And you know? I know I've never done this cause I'm not successful enough, but um, I, yeah, sometimes if you have the star cast and you're casting someone who has to work with that star, they do a screen test where you do the scene with them and that's an audition, but that wasn't the case for oh. expanse. Wow. And then you got to go fly out to Toronto and freeze your butt off. <laughs> we shot during it was February. Oh man. Okay. Season five, episode nine. The, the episode that I'm in the most, the episode where, where we're at that, that mansion Right, and the big um, shootout and everything. <laughs> Man, that was that was a lot. That was an extreme on all fronts. It was a it was an extra long day. It was like a 20 plus, it was like a 16 hour plus day um outside at night during winter in Canada. Like and I'll I'll sure I'll think of some, but it was just it was every complicating, cold, exhausting factor was present on, yeah, on, on, on that, on that day. Oh, I know. Okay. So guys, um, if you don't watch Ty and that guy, you got to watch that podcast. Cause that's Wes Chatham and Ty Frank, Ty Frank being the, one of the authors of the expanse and also seems to be the one that's the most involved with the show. Anyways, they have a great podcast and that's how I found you was you were a guest mm-hmm. on Ty and that guy. And then I was thinking, Oh, okay. I'm going to go look him up and see if he'll want to be on my show. But so I remember there was a spot in there where there was some quote where like you were like totally at the end of your rope and Wes came up to you and go, how you doing, man? And you're like, I'm, I'm fucking about to break yeah. up here. I just, this is it. I can't take this anymore. 
I have a, I have a million stories from Toronto. I had a great time. That was a that was a life changing experience. Um, was that the first time you'd ever done any kind of action type of show? Uh, for sure. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I was a very active child. I played football. I had a black belt in taekwondo. I shot guns on my family's ranch. So I did all those things in my personal life. But that was my first time ever performing that type of physical exertion for the camera okay. yeah right. but yeah um that i mean anyone who has seen that episode of time that guy will remember this but like yeah a sh long story short it was fucking 4 a.m <laughs> you know and and it was um it was at that big old mansion and we were shooting we were shooting the chase scene we were shooting that long seemingly one shot chase scene that was mimicking 1917 what what's that movie 19 oh you know that I can't world remember. World. it's that world yeah. I, oh my god some of the listeners are screaming at their screens right now it's it, it's that world war 1 movie called like i'm going to guess 1917 but okay. um and because it was all like one shot, one long consistent shot, that was what inspired the chase scene. Breck and Wes saw that in theaters and they were like, that was so sick. We should do a long, complicated one shot action scene. And so that's what we were doing. We were shooting that chase scene to get to the spaceship to escape Earth and go to the moon. What a sentence. We were shooting that action scene where we were trying to escape earth to get to the spaceship and go to the moon. <laughs> and um, uh, it, it was like 4 a.m. It was 4 a.m. And we were practicing that scene where one of the stunned actors shuts the door and then the, the militia shoots him through the door. And the, uh, the stunt actor was, had all these squibs on him and he was doing that thing where he, right. And on the, and they, we were doing that shot for the fifth time. And I was in this garage. I was standing in this garage. Like, I was always trying to be 30 feet away from Breck just so I was there when he needed me. Mm -hmm. But I was standing over one of the heaters. I was standing over one of the electric heaters and I, I had my gun and I was, I was hugging my gun because I had nothing else to hug. <laughs> and I just, and I was like, I, I've been up for I've been up for 30 hours. I've been I've been awake for too long. I'm I'm tired. I'm making so much money right now. I'm in golden time. Um after you work for eight hours, you make time and a half for two hours, and then you make, you know, uh, uh double time for several hours. And then we were in this phase of SAG called golden time where you're just making stupid money every hour. Quadruple I'm just, time or something. <laughs> something. I, I have to double check what it is exactly. But I was standing there. I'm like, Jacob, why can't you be grateful? You're you're making golden time. You're on a movie set. You're you're it's Amazon. I can't be grateful because I'm so fucking tired <laughs> and, and cold. And so I was yeah. just pulled between the extremes of like physical abuse and the the highest privilege I've ever had in my life, and um, Wes came over, and Wes is a trickster. He's a gamester. He's a he's a joker. He's usually full of shit. He's usually right. saying something mean to me. <laughs> yeah, and that, all that comes off on Ty and that guy. You can totally see. Yeah, who, what the real Wes on that show? <laughs> so, but Wes, wow. Wes could see I was up against it. And he actually came up to me with some genuine, like, honest human concern in his voice. He was like, hey, buddy, you okay? And I just turned to him and I said, I'm at the end of my fucking rope. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed his ass off. And that's Wes's favorite story about our time together yep. to this day. It's that's just wild. like, we're doing one of the coolest things we've ever done. But we're also exhausted and uh there's beauty somewhere in between there but it's the tension between two extremes yeah ah uh, that's wild okay well, here's a technical question for you so mm -hmm. uh when they shoot their guns do they actually have blanks in them or is all that cgi when the guns actually fire um two answers one we had two guns i had a fake plastic gun that didn't fire that was very light but whenever we did a firing scene, they would swap it out and they would hand me 
a real P90. The gun that I had was called a P90. It was a gun. It was like a machine gun you could hold with one hand. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that was modified to fire blanks. So I was, uh, my gun was firing. My gun was actually firing blanks. However, Amanda Cordner, uh, my, my bestie, my best friend who played, um, Hutch, Mm -hmm. my, my sidekick, my, my lieutenant, Mm -hmm. she had a gun that fired blanks, but, um, during one shot, this is to her credit, Amanda Cordner is killing it. She's in a, she's in another show in Canada right now called sort of on HBO. Um, she rolled out and she screamed and she went, ah, and she pulled her trigger and something was wrong with her, with her guns. It wasn't Jammed. firing the blanks, yeah. but she had the intuition in the moment to perform it. So she went, ah, and she was shaking it and like, Rah. so those shots were digitally okay put in. So like, like, like they added the the hex shape at the end of the muzzle. So they were real blanks. And then some of the shots are digitally put in due to. Okay. So like in a scene like that, when you guys are firing blanks and stuff, I mean, are you guys all wearing earplugs or how do you keep from blowing your ears out? Yeah. Yeah. We, we They gave us these, these uh, skin colored earplugs to put in. Okay. And, um, and you, you pack them in and you're fine. It protects your hearing a hundred percent. And they either, avoid shots that you can see your earplugs or they digitally remove your earplugs after the fact. But a fun fact, we shot a couple of those big blowouts in the driveway when the whole gunfight starts. Then we went to dinner, took my earpieces out. I went to dinner. We came back. Everyone was checked. I thought I had all my things crossed. Um, and then when we came back to shoot another shot of that fights of that gunshot scene um, after dinner, I forgot to put my earplugs back in. And I think that's the shot that they used because I wasn't even thinking about ear protection up until Breck said action. And then people started shooting guns and I, and I, I heard the gunshots, but like, at the actual volume they are right and i didn't have ear protection and in a in a split second i was like oh fuck I, i'm not wearing my ear protection this is so loud and scary this is so loud and scary okay i gotta say my line and i gotta do this action now and i followed through with the action of the shot but all I, if if that is indeed the shot they used all of the terror and the flinching and the the <laughs> the trauma in my face is real. real because yeah. because I didn't I was hearing all of those gunshots at full capacity. Okay, and then when you guys do have your earplugs in, how do you hear uh, the commands of the director and stuff? Uh, Breck wasn't calling anything out live in the scene. We all had okay. our direction. We knew what the sequence was. We rehearsed it, and okay. then we would we would shoot it. And I could hear my fellow scene partners yelling shit, like uh-huh. faintly. the The earplugs just block the the loud ping shock value of of sound waves, but you can still hear people okay. talking. But uh, uh, Breck was not live calling directions during shots. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Really interesting. Yeah, there's so much that goes into something like that. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, um, all right. So we I promised that we would only go an hour. So now we've we're having going 40 fun. minutes. We're having, we're having fun. I I I I appreciate you respecting my request. I I try to keep my podcast appointments down to an hour. You can cut this out if you want. You can leave it in. I love the liveness of it. We 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 can keep going. I'm Okay. I I hope you understand why I had to ask for that but yep. we're, we're having fun so we, we, we you don't need to worry about time if there's stuff that's important to you okay so what i want to do is i want to make sure that we do talk about uh theater evolve mm-hmm. which um i'm guessing that's your main gig your main uh passion right now right 
Is that true? Um, it it is occupying most of my time right now. Okay, but it it is one of the many things in my artistic thrust of being in the prime of my life in my thirties. Uh-huh. Theater Evolve is very important to me. It's uh, I'm working with my three best friends. The three of us run this storefront non-union company together. We don't get paid, but we pay everyone we hire to do our projects. Okay. And, um, and I think that we have heart and we do really good work. And our show, our, our last season just closed. We just finished, a. Um, the world premiere of Krugazor. Right. I'm looking at it right now. And uh, Krugazor was this amazing show about um, musicians in the Soviet Union who smuggled American rock music in under the eye of the government censors. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Do you um, guys have rock music in the show? Like perform there was, there was songs? A, it was a cast of eight a cast of eight actors who were also musicians cool. who also performed the action of the play and they were a rotating they functionally rotated to be a live band at the back of the stage uh, um, cool all right electronic yeah. drums there was good there were guitars there were there's a keyboard um yes we did we did legally questionable 30 second covers of all of the major American rock hits from right. the six sixties to the eighties to the nineties. Oh, cool, um, man. Okay. And, and that was a live show. Um, do you guys, did you guys film it? Like are you able to put any of it on YouTube or how does well, that work? We, good question. I've never heard that question. I, we, we have a, an archived recording of a performance. It's okay. a single, it's a single camera parked in one place recording the whole thing. Kind of a wide shot. Yeah. Yeah, kind of exactly. But so there is footage. There's a jillion pictures. We hired a photographer to take a bunch of pictures too. So okay. I can sh- I can share those. There is, we do have a press packet. This was a big get for us. Um, anyone in Chicago knows the Chicago Reader is a formidable uh, p- publication in the pantheon of Chicago media okay. and the Chicago reader gave us a review and they recommended us. So right. they gave us a positive review and we are Chicago reader recommended. I uh, see. It um, says right here, the critics are raving. The critic. Well, we had two <laughs> critics and both of them said, good job. So well, there you go. Yeah. Um, that's, that's great. Yeah. That's cool. was, so yeah. I looked I, I looked on the cast and the designer and I didn't actually see your name anywhere in this. So I guess you're like uh, just the producer or um, yeah. what was your role yeah. in the show? The four of us, me, Mary, Elise, Anna, we, the four of us are the, <laughs> the heart and soul of the company. We run everything. We I pay the taxes and I keep our registration with the IRS active. Um, uh, 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 Mary writes our contracts for our various artists. Um, Anna was the director of Krugazor. Elise was the props designer for Krugazor. So they had active parts in the show. Okay. I, I'm involved in everything the company does, but I was a non-artistic producer for, for this, this show. company. So I didn't really have a credit in the production because I was just part of the the parent company, if that makes okay. sense. Okay. And yeah. then for for um, Theater Evolve, just generally, do you see yourself like potentially acting in some of the shows or writing or, or directing some of them or? Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, next season is a generous gift for me. Like, uh, okay. Because next season in October, we are producing my one-man production that I've oh, been cool. writing for like six years. Um, it is a it, it is a modern retelling, new take, new perspective, um, interpretation, reaction to Edgar Allan Poe, okay, and his life. It is okay. the it's a ninety-minute motorcycle ride through Edgar Allan Poe's life if he was a millennial in 2023. So 
Okay. You so know. is the raven now a parrot or is it still a raven? Well, <laughs> it's – no, well, I, I perform the raven a lot. never more. <laughs> this might flop. This might be really boring. I'm taking a lot of risks, but um, – okay. Uh, I wrote this script. I believe in it. And I've collected a few people who also believe in it. Okay. Um, it is, I'm a trained Shakespeare actor and I'm taking oh, those, great. I'm taking those poetic heightened verse talents and I'm trying to put them into performing pose poetry live. So the script is like 60% my own words and 40% like pose poetry. Okay. And um Everything is ordered in a way to walk us through his life. Okay. As I have interpreted from like the two or three books I've read on his life. And then it's just artistically put, it's artistically set in, you know, 2023. So he's, he, not only is he an alcoholic, but he is addicted to his phone. Okay. He's, I was going to say he's got a phone. He's, He's always sending emails to people who won't hire him or who won't pay him. He's, now, okay, um, here's a question. Is he on Twitter or Mastodon or both? <laughs> Ooh, you know, it's I it's not, not specific as that. So the 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 biggest relationship with tech is so the presence of the Raven comes in the form of like an Alexa speaker. Oh, cool. That was good. So, That's a good idea. He has an electronic assistant okay. on his desk. And it's a one-man show. There's nobody else physically present on the set, but there's lots of voice actors and recordings, so he only interacts okay. with the world through this speaker. Okay. And he he begs the speaker to give him different answers sometimes, to tell him different things, but sometimes it, it just repeats the same answer over and over, which is kind of like the raven. The raven only says never more. Does this and, Raven say nevermore or does is no, a modern it's, version of it? It's 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 a really loose connection. I really wonder if audiences are gonna get it, if they're gonna like it or agree with it. But um, you know, when you say, Alexa, do I have any messages? Or Alexa, what time is it? Or Alexa, and she goes, It's 4 13, and you say AM or PM or whatever. She just repeats the same thing over. And I, I, I related to that um, that emotional struggle that a lot of us have with our mental health these days where we'll interact with our technology and we'll go back at the technology over and over and over again, trying to get a different response. And it's just a computer. It just gives you the same response right. back. multiple. And the definition of insanity is... Um, you know... It, trying I, it over I, I and over I, again. Yeah. It, a new result, yeah. I don't know who that who who that quote is, but I think Einstein know. quote. I think that's an Einstein quote. Okay. Yeah. Uh, love it. I believe you. But no, that's like, like me. Like when I like if I'm texting somebody, you know, and I'm like getting in a conversation with them, and then but you know they're not responding for like five or ten minutes, and I've just come out. I'm like, come on, where are you? You know, I can sort of relate to something like that, and then finally you do get a response, or at least they might give you a smiley face or a heart. <laughs> right but in the meantime in the meantime you're it's it's self-inflicted right yeah because you have sent them a text if your relationship with this person is healthy they will respond to you in due time right but you're like we you're like, <laughs> we, we, we just see like now 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 Ugh, why aren't you responding to me i'm sorry i'm so needy i just want to know are you okay are we okay like yeah. It's, it's, okay. Let, let's ask this though. You know, that's what's so weird is when we're texting somebody, right? Mm -hmm. We feel like we have a connection to that person. So do we, or is it all complete illusion? Because really all we are is, all we have is a phone and a bunch of texts. Well, you Are we really connected to that person or not? You put a command into the phone the phone responds to you. It does what it's, it's, it's a task. It's a flick of the thumb, right? You do this, you do X, Y happens, right? Humans are, are not phones, but you, if you interact to humans through okay. phones, you might think, Oh, if I text them, it's like a task and surely they will respond like my right. phone. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but like, it feels to me like that. Like surely, if I say something to them through text, they are obligated to respond. 
Right. And no, no one's obligated to inter- engage with you, you ever. I'm, what but, I'm trying to get at is like, okay, we could go deeper. Like, are you and I really talking to each other? Or is this all just a big illusion and it's all fake? Because really, we're just talking to our laptops. We're not actually connecting as real people. Or are we actually connecting? I think we are. Like, I think we are, too. I think we are. You and yeah. I are not... Um, you and I are not engaging as deeply as we would if we were in the room at the same time, because if we were in the same room at the same time, you know, we would, uh, we would be able to see each other's entire bodies. Mm -hmm. We would be able to quote unquote, smell each other. We would be able to, there would be a more sense each other's aura even maybe, you know, but at the end of the day, right now, even though I'm just like projecting to a piece of plastic and metal and you're, you know, um, like an insane person and my cat's looking at me like, I, I don't know this guy. Um, you, I, I am changing your brain and you are changing my brain. So right. like that's, that's real, right? That's not yeah. fake. I think so. And I actually, I'm, I find, I used to struggle with this when I was much younger, but I finally decided, you know what? I mean, every, on one hand, everything's an illusion, you know? Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, you know, as long as both of us believe that we're connected, I'm gonna say like on a spiritual psychic realm, we actually are connected. Like our spirits are connecting either through this laptop or just like through the cosmos. Like we actually have a connection that mm-hmm. the laptop it's facilitating enough so that basically we both believe in it. And as long as we believe in it, that makes it happen. Well, I think it's important yeah. to, I think it's important that you and I both want to be here. Mm-hmm. Neither of us is being forced to be here. You're not paying me and no one's putting a gun to your head. So right. like that means both of us are choosing to be here. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, like there, there is a, um, this moment, this episode is the manifestation of us trying to create the lives that we want to have. Mm-hmm. And it is a fulfillment of that, assuming I don't embarrass myself and get canceled and assuming you, you know, get the viewership you want. Like this is us enacting our dreams upon our own lives in yeah. real time. So yeah, yeah, like that. that's, it's the struggle of having the life you want to have, right? Yep. Or Yep. And I applaud you too, because I, I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid fifties now. Mm-hmm. And it, it, when I was in my thirties, I wasn't going for it. Like you are now in your thirties, you know, I was trying to just have a kind of a normal job. And I did a lot of music and stuff like that. But I wasn't like, I knew I was holding myself back. And I sort of always felt like I'd sold out just to make a living. Mm-hmm. But um now Nothing. I realize, you know what, I didn't really have to, I mean, it's still good to have a side gig that makes some money, but it, you don't have to put yourself in a really rigid box either. You can do both. I mean, you know? thank you. That's very sweet. And I I am working quite hard, but um, I, you say I'm in my 50s and I, I'm impressed that you're working in your 30s. And right now I'm working in my thirties, but I wish I didn't waste my twenties, you know, <laughs> like, and, and someone in their twenties is like, man, I wish I would have taken my dad up on those dance lessons when I was 17 and yeah. someone with you know, and then there's a point of no return because there are children in very repressive countries who are forced from the age of five to learn how to play the mandolin. Mm-hmm. And they're amazing. They're amazing. They're so good. But are, I don't know. Did they choose that, or right? Am am I choosing this, or am I just doubling down on something I decided to do eight mm. years ago? <laughs> I mean, accomplishing things, accomplishing career goals that are validated by other people, by strangers, accomplishing mm. career goals that are validated by strangers is only useful. If you're having fun, you should not, you should not do it if you're not having fun. And that, that's the only, uh, guiding light I have. I'm still having fun. 
Mm -hmm. I'll quit if I stop having fun. (laughs) Um, Okay. You know, it. uh, Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to back up a little. So when did you you have this idea to do this Edgar Allan Poe script? How long has that been swimming around in your mind? um, Well, I told you that I'm a trained Shakespeare actor. Mm -hmm. Um, I graduated college in 2011. I left Savannah, Georgia and Right out the gate, I was doing that like hard hustle thing that a 20 year old does where they like sacrifice life, happiness <laughs> and friends and family to uproot their life and live in a suitcase. And I I, um, I went to work at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. Okay. And basically what I was trying to do was this thing called gigging that regional actors do, which is you move every four or five months (laughs) and you, 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 I went to the Shakespeare theater of New Jersey and then I went to the um, Williamstown theater festival in uh, Massachusetts for two months and then i had lined up a job after that and i went to the jewish ensemble theater in michigan for nine months and then i went to the utah shakespeare festival for five months and the idea is just to build your resume or what what's the what's the the it depends on the end of the you're acting you're a working actor you're an employed actor you you have a paycheck and the idea is to do that forever (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and to never stop. <laughs> and okay. that's, that's the, uh, so that's, I mean, well, I mean like TV actors do kind of the same thing. They're constantly, you know, auditioning. And then whenever they get a guest star role, then they go do that that week. Right. Well, that's, that's why I am honestly personally trying to do more TV and less theater right now. Mm-hmm. When I, when I early career after college, my um all of my classics training all of my shakespeare training being a classically trained actor there's this bias against tv there's like this bias that like oh man all of the richness all of the value all of the the juice of acting is in doing shakespeare being a shakespeare actor doing classics doing theater don't worry about tv it's so shallow it's all shallow well, hold and, on. Okay, All right, I'm going to stop you right there. So, mm-hmm. so stage acting is, of course, for one thing, you gotta, you can't just take ten takes and then throw out nine of them and then put the good one in there. Mm-hmm. But um, also, you don't have such a thing as close ups and things where on TV and stuff you can be a lot more subtle, at least with yeah. your expressions, and right. Yeah, the 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 craft is way different in live theater than it is on screen. In live theater, you have to park yourself. You have to have the stage presence. You have to project to the back row. You have to make sure your voice is healthy enough. You have to have intimate moments loudly. Um, you have to use gestures that are big enough. It's 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 a. I mean, it's the same, but it's a different skill set and when stage actors transition in TV, they have that problem of like directors telling them all the time, lower your voice, lower your voice, lower your voice. You don't need to yell. You don't need to yell. The camera's right here. You don't have to yell. And it's freeing to realize, oh, I can like whisper this line. I can raise an eyebrow and that affects the narrative of the scene. Mm -hmm. Um, So they're the same, but they are different skill sets. Um, but I think, I don't know. I think about, I, the thing about stage acting is like, well, you, it seems like you have more control over your performance. Like when you're doing TV or movies, you're really at the mercy of how they edit it, right? Like you don't know which take they're going to take, mm-hmm. you know? And so... And well, yes, when you're on TV, you are much, much, much less in control. I, 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 when you're, um, on being on stage is about mustering this this physically exhausting experience of projecting out this performance and, um, on camera, you have no control over what take they're using that the, 
the director is giving you feedback in live time. And um, I, uh, I definitely, when I, when, when I do TV, I feel like it's way more on the fly. You don't get to think about stuff as much. Things are not as intentional. I got a, I, I, I was actually in the last stages of callbacks for a lead role in a Netflix show that would have transformed my life forever. And I didn't get it. And that's okay. But one of the notes that the casting director kept giving me is that um, you're, you're very stagey. You're very controlled. Okay. You're taking a lot of pauses in between your line and the next person's line. It's mm -hmm. very formal. It's very theatrical. Well, and for Shakespearean, <laughs> and for yeah, yeah, no, that that I, I, it was still too deep in my bones. I couldn't shake it for that opportunity at that moment. Yeah, and um, and I could tell what they wanted was for me to just be this unburdened, reactive, emotionally responsive, uncalculated, uncontrolled creature. <laughs> and uh and i'm working on that i'm having fun training that impulse okay and that mind space and i'm getting there i i'm so i'm, sl I'm doing more tv but i but in I, that particular I wasn't show would they if they want you to be that uh sort of off the cuff would they let you improvise or do you, do you still have to strictly stick to the script You got to stick to the script. <laughs> it, 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 it sucks. It's, it's so hard. Um, I mean, some directors will let you do your own. They'll let you do alternate takes and stuff. And other do. shows are like, no, you have to get it exactly right. You know, there was a comma there that you didn't do and do it again. You know, you they know I mean? do. I have not yet worked on one of those sets. So I you got to be, you got to treat yourself well on your one man show. You can't, you can't be a stickler to yourself. Like, are you going to have to say all the lines exactly how you wrote them? <laughs> well, you know, it's weird because the only person who could potentially exercise dominion on me in that situation is the director. We're hiring uh, a, a really nice live theater Chicago director who I have a lot of respect for. I worked with him at the uh, Michigan Shakespeare Festival. Okay. And I guess, I guess, and I trust him. That's the thing is I trust him to know what the right thing to do is because I won't always know what the right thing is. Wow. So if he tells me to behave in a certain way, I will take that into consideration. But he is my boss artistically in the moment, but administratively as a producer, I am also technically his boss. Um, <laughs> so this is interesting. So, well, I mean, so he, it's going to take a lot of courage for him to be directing you in your own play where you're you yeah. wrote it and you're the lead actor but he's gonna direct you i mean doesn't he gonna wonder if he knows what he's doing we're also friends i think it's gonna be <laughs> fine i mean okay. if i if i wanted to if i wanted to ruin an opportunity that's taken me six years to to like manifest okay i could i could make this a very toxic situation <laughs> and like exercise my power and make him miserable and feel like he's not serving any purpose, but that's not why we're here. Like I, okay. I he's, he's, he's a wonderful artist. I feel lucky that he agreed to do this and I, I can't wait for us to collaborate. And okay. I love, honestly, I'm going to be so busy writing right. insurance policies, securing event insurance for the company for this production, doing all that kind of admin stuff, paying our non-for-profit taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but like, that's a completely different part of your brain. I'll be happy I mean, that's... when he when he says, I want us to do this, okay. I will be happy to say, awesome. You have put the brain power into making that decision, and I trust you. And I'm too busy to decide what to do myself. So, like, yes, Let's go for it. This is this is why we hired you is to think about that shit for me. That's does that cool. make sense? Well, okay. So, and it's are you going to film that? Like, since that's a one man show, it seems like that'd be really easy to film. My goal, my secret goal. I'm I'm just focusing on doing this production now, but. Mm -hmm. Edgar Allan Poe was such a uh, ubiquitous 
figure my goal is to produce this show and then keep the show in my pocket and I can do it again. Like it could be my Halloween cash cow or something. Like I could mm -hmm. tour it. I could take it to other States. Like I could take it to other cities and I could, you know, throw it up with a, a simple touring set. And, um, uh, so I'm not, I, I know I, I have no goals to recreate it digitally, virtually on media online, mm -hmm. But I would, it's a very, it's going to be a very live theater experience. And I'd love to um, do it again in other live spaces. That's what I'm getting at. It's like, I mean, suppose you, you filmed every night, you know, but instead of doing a, a big wide shot, like maybe you could, like, what? Uh, your, how many nights is it going to perform? Uh, nine shows. It's going to be nine performances, uh, three weeks, Thursday, oh no, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for okay. three weeks. So what you could do, even if you only have one camera, I mean, the first show you do the whole the wide shots, right? Next night, mm -hmm. it have the cameraman do a bunch of close ups, and then by the at, by the end of the nine shows, you have all these different camera angles that you could potentially edit together to make it look like you know, yeah. not a, more like a camera type of thing, That's even though a it's good... a live show, but you'd be able to do that. That's a good idea. We'd probably have to double the photography artist budget like 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 the, it's so funny like you say that that's an amazing idea and the first thing i think of is the budget and convincing my co-workers to release that money for that privilege because that mm -hmm. is you know because yes like that that means we will have the photographer there for an extra two or three nights which probably means we have to pay him twice as much but that is that worthwhile I think so, but it's my show, so I got to convince them that it is. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, if we're going to make like a whole digital release, like if we're going to create a a digital piece of media, that requires it. That's a whole second production. Like there's well, editing then involved. You need an and, editor, of course. Yeah. Unless so you know how to do it. That's another line item. Okay. Um, that's a and good course, idea. That's, the editor that's really has to be good, too. I mean, uh -huh. when you if everything lives and dies by how good the editor is you can't let but, your your nephew who's good on mm -hmm. photoshop do it <laughs> no, the person has to be good mm -hmm. yeah can we take a quick bathroom break can uh, i sure i'd I... love to take a bathroom break well we, we're past now we're in 70 minute land so i mean nah. i'm supposed to let you go no i'm i'm having a good time we're at we're at we're not at 70 minutes we're oh i guess we are we started yeah. Let, let me go to the bathroom real quick. We can go okay, as, lo too. as much longer as you want to go, okay? Okay. All right, cool. Yeah. One second. That's quite all right. Now we can just <sighs> cut it all out with the magic of editing. No, leave all of that in. Leave the whole <laughs> silence in for the, for the listeners. Yeah. <laughs> to prove that we did the entire thing uncut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so my question um, is, so what... What is the thing about Edgar Allan Poe that that obviously pull is a pull for you? What is it? Is it the macabre nature of it, or, or? no? You know, and that's that's an amazing question, and I I love it when people ask that because I love to clear this point up. I don't relate to the macabreness. I don't. My honestly, like we're producing my play during October because everyone associates Poe with Halloween. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not interested in Edgar Allan Poe because of the spooky, scary factor. Um, okay. I, I, I wrote this show for two reasons. One, I am a Shakespeare trained actor who is tired of Shakespeare. I am, I'm like, I'm trained to, I'm trained in the craft of projecting heightened metered prose poetry. Mm -hmm for hours at a time at an audience and tricking them into thinking it's interesting. And, um, wait, you just opened up a three hour discussion right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. But like, like I'm like, look, 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 I've, I've, I've gone, I've gone the full gauntlet on Shakespeare. Okay. If you ask someone who is not educated on Shakespeare, why they don't like Shakespeare, They'll say because it's boring. They speak old English. I don't know what they're saying, and it's it doesn't seem to be relevant anymore. Now, okay, well, when, when you're in, when you're in college, when you are a Shakespeare actor training in college, 
Okay. People in the industry who truly understand Shakespeare show you the other side of it. They teach you, A, it's not old English. It is modern English. And Shakespeare actually shaped the way that we speak English today. It is it is accessible English to modern audiences. And if the audience doesn't understand what the Shakespeare actor is saying, it is the, the actor's, actor's fault. fault. Right. That is true. Also, Second, if they don't care. Second, like, I mean, like, for example, mm -hmm. like, I, I always, my one is like, like, Senor Antonio, mm -hmm. many a time and often the reality you have raised me about my monies and my usances. Still, have I borne it with a patient shrug for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You know, so, I mean, I worked on that for a year to get that monologue going. Mm -hmm. And um, beautiful. It was beautiful. It was very clear. I understood what you were saying. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah, you, and I was trying you clearly to clearly get it. You get it. And, and I, I can tell you understand. But go ahead. But so that's it. I mean, uh, you go and watch people doing Shakespeare on YouTube, and so much of it, in my opinion, completely sucks. Well, because and that's, there's nothing, they don't put anything in it that you can actually relate to. And that's you know? my problem is I understand Shakespeare is some of the most beautiful drama ever composed in the English language. It is a gift to English speakers. Um, 90% of it is bad. Like 10% of Shakespeare that's produced these days is life-changing theater. It's amazing. It's really, really good. 90% of it doesn't have the effort, education, um, attention put into it that achieves that. Yeah. And well, also, like, it's a little, like, yes, after I've been on the defensive side of it, I have come full circle. It's a little dated. It's a little old. It's a little sexist. It's a little, a lot of the references are not in our, our cultural zeitgeist anymore. We don't use ducats. We don't use doublets. We don't use, like, like, yeah, it's, okay, it's, I'm gonna, it's I'm gonna, hard. I'm gonna it's counter hard. that one. So, um, yeah. have you ever seen the show, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean? Mm hmm. <laughs> That's dated. They don't speak in Shakespeare, <laughs> but that I is mean, a, very contemporary dialogue. Yes, that is however, not... it's set many hundreds of years ago and everybody goes crazy over it, right? Right, I'm not talking about the setting of the drama, I'm talking okay. about the delivery of the okay. dialogue. Okay. See, they do that uh -huh. in operas too, I don't know if, you, if you're into opera. Okay. They'll do like, you know, a Mozart opera, but then they'll, everybody will be dressed up as gangsters mm -hmm. with Tommy guns or something. And so, but for the exact same thing, you're trying to kind of force people out of their mold, but you still sing all the same music. You still sing all the same lines. Yeah. And there's a huge disconnect between the set and what was originally expected, but that's okay now. That's just yeah. a way to kind of tweak people's brains. I mean, if you know? Shakespeare is gonna stay relevant, I mean, Shakespeare is losing. It's losing the battle of being popular. Okay. I like a few elite, a small population of elite educated people understand its true depth and value. And I am one of them, but I'm also like, I'm checking out. It, Shakespeare, it's got to, if it's going to stay relevant and if it's going to continue to be used, it needs to, it needs to be useful. And so, um, yeah, like I invite people to fuck with it. I invite people to, I just support people. I don't know. I don't care about like people who are like, we have to do it the way that Shakespeare's actors did it in, in the year two BCE, because that is the truthful, most, most valuable <laughs> of worth way to do it. I don't know. Shakespeare is great. It has a lot to bring, but it has to be of use to modern audiences. Okay. Otherwise, it like that. So, so I, I invite people to do whatever they have to do to it to make it useful because right now it's losing. It's losing okay. the battle of relevancy to me. Yeah. I don't know if you're also a musician, but like, so the same thing is always the case in classical music, like how to play Mozart or Bach. Mm -hmm. In Bach's case, we've got YouTube videos where you got heavy metal guitarists playing 
Bach on their electric guitars doing all this crazy. And they th people just completely love it. Awesome. Do yeah. that. Play Mozart yeah. on an electric guitar. Yeah. That's that is yes, I I need Gen Z to <laughs> like do crazy shit to stuff because I like that's the way that sh stuff is going to survive the ages. Yeah. Because you can lecture people, you can tell them this is really important. This is really valuable because it's 500 years old and it shaped the way that you speak English now. But if it's not compelling, no one will care. And right. so like Obviously, when you take that too far, something can just be flashy and glitzy and glamoury and shallow and have no value to impart. But I hope you hear what I'm trying to say, which is the balance is that you take the value of something old and you package it in a way that people today find um, compelling and insightful and cathartic to their human experience because the challenges and the mental health struggle that we're dealing with now is not what the same. It's just not the same as what people right. are going through at the time. We got the internet now. <laughs> One thing. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So I took you on a big uh, tangent, which it happens. I feel like I got defensive. I'm sorry if I got No, defensive. that's okay. So yeah. the original question was, why did you, why are you really into um, Edgar Allan Poe? And then we went on a tangent about yeah. Shakespeare because I had well, to. I couldn't resist. <laughs> no, exactly. And thank you, thank you. That that is a that is a hill I have decided to die on, and maybe <laughs> I will. Maybe I will die on that hill. Um, I have latched onto Edgar Allan Poe because I am a trained Shakespeare actor who has noticed that my my soul, my artistic. I used to just like only do Shakespeare. I thought. This is my life. I will be a Shakespeare actor until I'm 70. Okay. Um, and then I just started to lose inspiration. I started to lose variety and spark. And I and then <laughs> I got hired to work at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. And that is kind of like Shakespeare because it has boots, broadswords, and doublets and kings and nobilities, but it is a very modern delivery of that medium. It is a very improv oriented um, performance experience. And I was out there wearing a $5,000 doublet going, Oh God, gee, good den, my Lord. I hope you're having a fair day. And I could like crack stupid, stupid jokes like that. And um, and I found it very freeing. And then in October, the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair runs this secondary festival called um, called uh, Poe Evermore. And I was cast as to play Edgar Allan Poe. And I performed The Raven. I performed The Raven in its entirety for okay. an audience. And The Raven, it's like about it's about a seven minute poem if you mm -hmm. perform it live. And I was doing it and I realized, holy shit, my Shakespeare training is informing my performance of The Raven. And I really like doing The Raven. When I perform Shakespeare, I feel like I am doing a job or a task of trying to bridge the gap between Elizabethan England and modern Chicago, but this, suddenly this is the same. This is heightened metered verse. It's not iambic pentameter, it's, oct uh, it's octameter, it's iambic octameter, meaning okay. that it has it has eight, eight beats per line instead of 10, but that just, that's an easy adjustment to make. And I realized all of a sudden, oh my God, I'm performing Shakespeare, but in Poe. And Poe was a, just a whole universe that wasn't burdened or loaded with all of the, these opinions that comes with Shakespeare. I, I, Whenever I perform Shakespeare, I'm just afraid I'm doing it wrong because yeah. so many 
so many everybody has an opinion about shakespeare right. you cannot perform any shakespeare without someone saying well i thought it was rather didactic and pedantic and yeah, yeah. and i'm just like i who am i performing this for am i talking to anybody or am i yelling <laughs> at a wall but i i i enjoyed poe i enjoyed performing the raven my Shakespeare training was making me do the Raven very well. My performance of the Raven was very well received. Um, and I realized, oh my God, it's like Poe is a Shakespeare, but he's a couple hundred years closer to me and he's American. And um, it was a it, it was just this accidental moment of finding that my talents applied to something that made me feel more rewarded. Mm -hmm. And so I chased that and I bought the complete works of Poe on my nook. And I was reading all the poems, not the short stories, but like the, the metered poems. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with it. And then I found the Edgar Allan Poe Society of Baltimore uh, website. Baltimore. Which... Ooh, the expanse. Mm -hmm. Baltimore. My mother lives in Baltimore. My mother grew oh, up wow. in Baltimore. Yeah. I had a whole connection to Baltimore the entire time. Uh, that's cool. Um, okay. I, I grew up, I grew up going to Baltimore for the holidays, uh, -huh. uh, to see my grandmother at Christmas and stuff like that. Did the casting um, directors know this? Uh, no, they didn't. But when I was <laughs> delivering that in episode seven, when I'm on top of that building and I'm looking out over the flooded cityscape and I, I say, um, Federal Hill, uh, Lonsdale, whatever this, that, the next thing I was like, Oh, I know all these, I know all these neighborhoods. Like my mom That's cool. told me about them. That's cool. Um, but just to wrap up the Poe thing real quick, I just, I, um, I found the Edgar Allan Poe Society of Baltimore online and they have a very succinct archive of every letter that he has ever written that's been recovered, of course, okay. uh, to anybody. And I was reading through his letters. And the letters that he's written to people tells a story. And I I received this flood of images. I was reading the letters right. that this man was. <clears throat> yeah. And I was reading his letters to his father. Mm -hmm. Very toxic relationship with his father. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I was reading his poems in the order they were written and published and i'm trying to match them in with the context of what was going on in his life and i thought this is a story this is definitely a story and i relate to some of it there is an issue with alcoholism there is an mm -hmm. issue with mental health mm -hmm. there is an issue with craving love mm -hmm. that is unrequited mm -hmm. there is an issue with fighting with people choosing to fight with people instead of letting stuff go there's yeah. this having public fights with people so i i related i fell in love with because i was struggling with being a shakespeare actor i discovered poe and i fell in love with his work and his life so i wrote a play that features both uh that is the 20 minute answer to your question that's good well i one of the most fascinating books i ever wrote same thing was Mozart's letters mm -hmm. it, that he sent. He wrote most of them to his, his sister and a couple to his dad. But the same thing where, like, you get inside his head. You know, it's like you get to be inside this person's head and you get to see all this intimate stuff that's just what was really going on with them. Yeah. I, I find it completely fascinating. There's some... Yeah. It, it's really... It's a very privately fascinating experience to read the letters of someone famous who is dead <laughs> yeah. uh, and to see the tender personal language that is unfiltered by the voice in their head that controls what they say when they know they're speaking publicly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's wild. Okay. Well, Let's wrap it up now. Otherwise, we're going to go another five hours. 
<laughs> but well, so, how about uh, well? Let's let's do this again sometime. If I should. ever well, if I ever produce a piece of media that is relevant that people give a fuck about ever again, then I will have a reason to come back. And well, I, I what we should do is we should hook up again after you do your Edgar Allan Poe show. Mm -hmm. That yeah. would be lovely. That'd In be fact, lovely. You, or we can do before if you want to help promote it before it even comes out. Let's see. Let's you know. see how we're doing. It's in October, and yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I've got things to plug today, so great, great. Yeah, really good. Okay. Um, now, I don't suppose you know anything about Star Trek. I love Star Trek. So oh. <laughs> i I grew up. Yeah, I'm a sci fi guy. Like, like okay. being on being on the Expanse satisfied a bucket list desire of mine. I said I, I always wanted to be a Jedi. I like. Honestly, like I was a kid, I was like, man, I would be happy if I could just be an, a Jedi who was murdered during Order 66. Like, like <laughs> that would that would be fine. Okay, of course but, that's um, Star Wars. Yeah, that's Star yeah. Wars. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I but the point is like I knew that I could never be on Star Trek or Star Wars um because I was too young. But being on the expanse satisfied that desire of mine to be sci-fi sci yeah. and I, I literally i got to sit in a spaceship i got to touch touch screens and boop and beep buttons and yeah yeah i love so I, I i grew up watching voyager voyager was oh, okay. my was my wow. love connection saw a little bit of deep space nine a little bit okay. of new generation um little bit of little bit of all the others but i am the most familiar with, with but voyager. you probably know this that a, a lot of star trek actors are shakespearean actors you know yeah, that? I mean, yeah, Mr. Stewart. Um, and well, but like the guy who played Quark in Deep Space Nine, Armin Shimmerman, mm -hmm. he is totally into Shakespeare. And then um, the original Star Trek, um, the original series TOS with Spock, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, mm -hmm. almost all their guest stars were Shakespeare actors. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. That I I I I knew that without actually knowing that. Like you're 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 right. Right, yeah. you're right. I did know that, but I didn't realize it. Like that, I because when I was at Utah Shakespeare Festival, there were lots of actors who had played tiny co-star day player contract roles. Yeah, on Next Generation or stuff like yeah. that. Well, what Armin Shimmerman said, he he played Quark in Deep Space Nine. Uh, he said that. He said his theory was that the they actually sought out Shakespearean actors because Star Trek has got so much techno babble in it that yes. the Shakespearean actors had the it's training the to be able to deal with skills. it. It's the linguistic skills. It's the language skills. That's yeah. that makes so much sense. Yeah, we have to said. plug the capacitor into the dilithium penetrator. Whatever. <laughs> you know, and it's all gobbledygook, but you have to be able to deliver it in a convincing way, you know? You have to be so serious because this is life and death right yeah. now. The, the, the transporters need more dilithium or yeah. they're going to separate people's atoms and turn them into fucking Cronenbergs. That right. is so funny. It's all true. I just, I recently interviewed Tim Ross, who played Tuvok on my channel. Uh-huh. So you might get into that one. I also got to play in his band. Mhm. Mm he, he he he's a he's, really good guitar player and He's singer. got a band. He he plays he play what does he play? He plays It's uh, it's mostly a, he plays a lot of um 70s and 80s uh cover stuff. Mm -hmm. But he he picks like the most obscure stuff. So like you know, oh that's 70s and 80s music, but I can't remember that song exactly. But he likes to do that. And uh, a lot of R and B too, plays guitar and sings, and um, he's got a band called Tim Russ Crew that plays in L.A. Mm -hmm. And anyways, um, once I once I interviewed him, then I, as what usually happens is we became kind of buddies because we got to know each other on the show here, and yeah. then um, I <laughs> I kind of where I, are you in the I'm world? I'm in Seattle. You're yeah. in Seattle. That's right. Yeah. You said that in an email. Okay. I'm yeah. In anyways. So yada, 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 I figured out a way to get him to let me play. I got him a gig where, where there's this other show called Space Command that I'm really involved in. Mm -hmm. And they had a big party New Year's Day. And then um, I convinced him to let me hire Tim's band to be basically be the band for the party. And then, then after quite a bit of cajoling, I got 
Tim to let me play my violin in one song during the party. And of course, I got, took selfies and Hell bragged yeah, about baby. it on Facebook afterwards. You played your violin with Tuvok. That's that's dope. Yeah. That's, that's dope as shit. I love that. Yeah. So anyhow. Yeah. That is, so, that and is actually a my life very experience. First, my very first acting teacher um, is Robert Beltran, who played, um, of course, uh, uh, Chakotay. So he was the one that got me into Shakespeare, and he was the one that well, um, basically started me off, you know, getting some actual acting training, whereas before I was just totally winging it. And so, anyhow. Chicote was a, a favorite of mine. I yeah. had this fast. I had. I don't know if you relate to this. I had this fascination with um, the first officers. It's an interesting position on a starship. It's like a supporting like role. Captain. Yeah, you're like the captain, except for the captain. Yeah, like every you're in charge of everything except for the captain. I I, I don't know. I don't know why that's fascinating to me, but it was just always this interesting like. You're the yeah. boss, except for the boss, sort of a situation. Like Mr. Spock. Yeah. 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 Spock. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, that means. Well, that... But what what is your what is your acting journey? You you you've you've been talking about classes you've been taking and stuff. What's your? I didn't know that you're an actor. Like, what's your? What are your projects, well, goals, hopes, uh, ta- dreams? I'm, talk about late in life. I mean, basically, it started out being a YouTuber, mm-hmm. and then. Um, I started make, writing little shows, you know, for my YouTube channel, and I started uh, doing Star Trek. Somehow, I can't remember how I ended up doing it, but I started a Star Trek fan series, and so now I've got like a show mm-hmm. called Egotastic Trek. I do it all with green screens, and um, my show is really unique because what I do is I take clips from all these other Star Trek shows, mm-hmm. and then I use a green screen to superimpose myself and other actors put into, yourself into it yeah or, but at, and then the the trick is the challenge is how to take all these fragmented scenes from all these different shows create a script that makes sense and now tell a new story using some of the dialogue from the old shows and then putting in my own dialogue and so it's it's a real trip of editing <laughs> Anyways, I am in love with that. I am in love oh. with that. That is such a smart way to take advantage of the the cultural relevance of something and to contribute to it and to acknowledge the impact it has on your life and to share to to, to take ownership of something that you love. I that that sounds so cool. Like yeah. obviously there's copyright issues and whatever That's involved. That's the catch. Like, of course, is I could never ever sell it and make money. I can <laughs> no. only do it on YouTube. But it feeds the soul. Yeah. It, it yeah. will never feed your pocket, but it right. feeds my soul way more than I would ever want money from it. So what I tell I, people is what I'm doing. I'm literally what I'm doing is exactly what I did when I was a kid, where I would just you know daydream and pretend I'm in a Star Trek show, mm-hmm. you know, and just date, make up all these daydreams, and but I would be in it with Captain Kirk and all those guys. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing now, except I'm a grown-up, and mm-hmm. I got the technology to make it actually look like a real show. Yeah, you're a grown-up, and you got grown-up money. So, yeah. you can, so you can do all the shit that your, like, fifth-grade home yeah. movie self wanted to make. Yeah, exactly. I... Uh, Rock now on, it, man! You live your fucking your fucking truth. I'm, I'll I'm send here you, for I'll that. I'll send you uh, 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 my latest one. The other thing I realized is I can use Star Trek as the core of it, mm-hmm. but then once I figured out how to do that, I realized I can do I can take any show and do this. So, like my latest one, it, it's Star Trek. But what we'd end up doing is we go into the Matrix, and then I just <laughs> basically do a takeoff in the Matrix. It's you know, like when the Flintstones met the Jetsons. You exactly. Can, you, you, it's you exactly can, that. <laughs> the craziest thing. Star this is what's Trek so is, nuts. Well, wow, so that, the Matrix is so big, it also encompasses galaxies and other planets. So Star Trek is also inside the Matrix. I I need to see what the It was so easy to do. You know, like. all I had to do? What? As we just jumped through... What I in the show we call it the giant donut of eternity. It's that big donut thing from it's from the Guardian of Forever, which is the 
it's basically a time portal, sort of like um, Stargate or something. Mm -hmm. We just jump into that, and then we come out on the other side, and we're in the Matrix. Then you say a couple <laughs> lines that explains why you're there, and then everybody believes it. And then for the next 20 minutes, we're just interacting with all these famous Matrix scenes. Like I do the, I knew, I do the, you know, the bending the spoon thing. There is no spoon. <laughs> I do that scene, uh, and then I go into the. I go into the kitchen and talk to the Oracle mm -hmm. all about stuff that's going to happen. Wait, what does the Oracle tell you? What is what? Because you're not the one. You're not Neo. Like, what does the or what does the Oracle tell you about your truth? Or well, okay. So the way I do that, or are you the one? Are are you? No, the I'm one not the in one. This, in I go in universe. there. My big problem is that I had this love affair with this lady named Elaine five years ago. And she suddenly reappears in my life, but unfortunately, and she never told me she was in Starfleet. So we had this fantastic love affair, but then she dumped me. I never found out why. And then she shows up five years later, but now she's the admiral. And I'm like, oh shit, my ex-girlfriend's now my boss. Yep. What am I going to do? That's a <laughs> so he has to go to the, setup. he has to talk to the, to the Oracle what to do. So instead, so, so the line was, are you the one? But in mine, it's, are you the one for Elaine? <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's just so many ways I have to figure out how to make the story work within the confines of certain fragments of dialogue. And that's anywhere. That's I'll cute. send it to you. I, I, I can't wait to see it. I, <laughs> I would love to see it. If yeah. I were to see the Oracle, I guess, obviously, she doesn't tell you what you want to hear. Or she says whatever you need to hear. But if I were to see the Oracle and I was the script writer for what the Oracle would say to me, the Oracle would say, Jacob, you are right about everything. And everyone who disagrees with you is an insecure, stupid baby. <laughs> and, <laughs> and all of your artistic partners, every you are the smartest person that has ever existed. And of course, that's Never what a prof what a medical professional therapist oracle or deity would ever say to you. Okay, you but, just uh, I mean now you've launched a whole nother discussion. So well, okay, we'll wrap it up. Tell me. Up. So, well, no, no, I, no. I, I, what I tell me. Go. So, so Jacob. So what is it? I mean, why do you need somebody to say that? Aren't you so? deeply connected to your artistic truth that it doesn't need to be affirmed. Oh, I don't, I don't need any, like I, I have a, I'm fine. Like I, I don't no, know. Then I, why I, did you mention it? Because so something, because there. it's hard, because <laughs> yeah. it's hard. I okay. understand. I am not special. I am okay. one person born into a world of 8 billion people. Okay. And I am very privileged to be in a world with a life where I can pursue artistic things. And I have to earn money. I have to go to work. I have to sling furniture. Mm -hmm. I have to pay bills. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, that is, that is, my life is so much better than probably 80% of the people on the planet. Mm-hmm. Because okay, I'm going to go to Christianity for a second. We have this famous quote, which is, it's, it's better to give than to receive. Okay. Okay. So, but I like to go deeper into that. And I'm like, well, if you have the power to give, that means that you have, there's a fullness in you that you're even able to give something, right? Whereas if you're receiving, it's like there's a poverty to it where you just you you need something there's an emptiness that you're receiving so if you go to that it's better to give to receive than it's well of course because if you're giving that means that you're in a better space so and i'm not talking about giving 20 dollars to somebody on the street or even being nice to someone i'm like what can what does this edgar Allan poe play give like maybe there's someone in the audience you know who's like mm -hmm on the verge of suicide and somehow something in that play was like, you know what? They, they watched the play and suppose they came up to you afterwards and you know what? I think there is some meaning to my life after all. And you know what? I'm going to live my life now. I'm not going to wish it's over. I believe in the artistic message of the play. The play is sound. It communicates a positive 
optimistic message that you can get better, you can make a difference, you have value. So the play is intact. And I guess what I'm saying now is some people hold a function, hold a benefit, produce a play, Uh and then they just invite people who can pay or something like that. They just, they, they don't, uh, I'm saying the, the play is here. I'm producing it. If I want this play to have an effect on the universe, you can never sit on your laurels. You have to do more work. So the burden is going to be on me and my coworkers to make sure that we, Until the last day, we just really try to reach people that we think this play is useful for. Give it your all. Just give it your all Mm -hmm. because this is, it's, I'm a Buddhist. It's, this is a world. I'm a yogi. This is a world of toil. (laughs) Internet shirt yoga. I love it. Yeah. This is a world of, you you can rest when you're dead. If you want to make a difference, you have to work for it. Having Mm -hmm. good intentions is not enough. So that that's all I'm saying is it it, it's exhausting. That's the world of samsara, if you want to use that term, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, the the the, the great irony of the whole thing is that once you become established in silence, let's call it, Mm -hmm. or awareness or whatever, there's uh, you become so established in that that all this world of pain and suffering and all that, it's like, what was the pain and suffering? I mean, there's things that are annoying and, but it's not like it's, it's irking my soul anymore because it's part of the, the miracle of creation. Right. Yeah. Because biologically the brain doesn't memorize pain. You don't re you don't re experience pain. Like pain, like I, trauma is different, but mm-hmm. like you, 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 you can't like you, you remember what you accomplished more. The, the hard work that you go through doesn't, doesn't hurt you as much as you love the memory of something that you did. Okay. There's a fear. I, I mean, yeah. we do remember fear, right? Different types of fear. <sighs> yeah. Fear blows. Fear yeah. Fear has a purpose. I mean, fear does have a purpose. It has a purpose to help us survive. (laughs) Like sometimes it's good to be afraid of certain things because Mm -hmm. if you're not, you're going to (laughs) die. Well, and that's the thing. Fear is a tool. Okay. Yeah. You, 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 you Mm -hmm. and a hammer is a tool. Mm -hmm. A hammer can be really useful if you know how to use it correctly. Mm -hmm. If you don't know how to use a hammer, you could hurt yourself with a hammer. So fear is useful if you realize that it the onus is on you to use fear properly. Correctly. Yeah, I'll buy that. Because you could, mi- I've done it, I've done it a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, you, you could misuse fear and hurt yourself. So mm-hmm. you can see fear as a friend and use it properly to protect yourself. Mm-hmm. And, exactly. And, yeah. It's all about balance. Woof. Um, yeah. And uh, of course, it's also good to do some therapy. I've done tons and tons of meditation my whole life, but then one day, I, I, when I look back, I'm like, you know, I did need to do all that meditation, but the other thing I really needed is just some good old fashioned therapy. Can I tell you something funny? <laughs> I, I I support the therapy message. I love the idea of therapy. I want everyone to. Uh, I love this podcast called Gayish. I'm a gay man. That hasn't really come up. We haven't talked about my gay shit. But, but we all we all found out about that and tie in that guy. Yes. Yeah. But um, so in gayish, they have the they get a lot of ads from um, BetterHelp, and they say everyone should be in therapy all the time for every reason, and I support that. I've never been in therapy just because I'm so fucking busy. I cannot find the gd time i have health insurance i have i should do it i come on man it's one hour a week i want to but finding uh, that's a bullshit excuse you have an hour a week it's you do come on it sucks i i should 
I, I want <laughs> to be in therapy. I am a, I'm not even like fighting you. I'm, I'm agreeing <laughs> with you. I should be in therapy. I want to be in therapy. My husband is in therapy. Like every, all of my friends are in therapy. I just can't fucking get around to it. Well, because that's a, that's finding an excuse. A, finding a good therapist is a little bit of a challenge. It's important. Well, yeah. okay, I was so anti-therapy for so many years because I I was like, you know, I do meditation. I I do all this stuff. I mean, I I don't need it. And the therapists don't own any shit. They, I mean, I don't need it. But then I had to really basically hit a major crisis in my life where I literally thought I was going crazy, mm -hmm. and I was I I basically had abandoned meditation. No. Because I was at this crisis point where every time I did meditation, all it did was dig up all the things that were wrong with me inside emotionally. And it just, it, it was like it just would open up a Pandora's box and I would just, it would just see all the insanity of a human mind and all the stuff. I couldn't deal with it. So I tried to run away from it. Finally, I fi finally my mom had been asking me to be do therapy for years. And I'm like, okay, I'll finally do it. I mean, what have I got to lose? I'm about to go crazy, literally. So mm -hmm. I'll do therapy. And what do you know? All I needed to do was, I was one of these people <laughs> that wouldn't talk about things to my friends, you know? And I just held everything in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And like my dad was bipolar and my sister who died 10 years ago was bipolar. And and, you know, and I was always wondering, maybe I'm kind of bipolar because I have lots of mood swings. And um, so, but I just couldn't, I was too proud to actually do it. Mm -hmm. But then when I started doing it, literally the, all I did was I would just go there once a week and babble on about whatever's going on in my mind. And my therapist would listen. She'd hardly see anything. She just sat there and listened. But just the, <laughs> the, the fact of me physically saying it and physically telling another human being what's going on with me was all it took to an untangle that stuff and let my, you know, the, just let my spirit and my body and my brain naturally heal itself because I all I did was spoke the words. Yep. It's just like in Christianity where they talk about how you have to confess your sins. It was literally confessing your sins, but to a therapist, you know, but you have yeah. to actually say it. At least that's how it worked for me. That's all I did. And like five years later, like I've, I've, all the things that were bothering me just sort of evaporated. And I was like, whoa, now I walk around feeling like I'm some like enlightened yogi, you know, mm -hmm. you know, like I can just go to the space of the heart without even trying. Yeah, you know, I mean, but, crossing the threshold of a of a of a of a mental illness uh, or a mental health checkpoint is it's a very rewarding thing. It's better than money. It's better than yeah. sex. It's you yeah. know, it's um, I read uh, Alan Carr's The Easy Way to Quit Vaping. It, it, it's a it's an anti it's like a quit smoking quit vaping book okay i recommend it to anyone who's struggling with nicotine like the um it's 200 pages read it in a week it 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 it, it turns your brain upside down and suddenly things that seemed insurmountable to your mind are suddenly just they just taste different to your brain like they did they just okay. you just don't so you see were it the vaping same way anymore. for a while and you wanted to learn how to quit mm -hmm. yeah and and and, okay. and i struggled with the with the willpowerness of it and it just it just turned my mind upside down and suddenly i was like oh i don't care about this and i don't want it anymore it, it's lovely anyway i didn't mean to hijack that i was just relating to what no, you were talking great. about like it's it the the way that practicing mental self-care can yeah. shift pers it's funny how much your physical health and your day-to-day -day walking around mo is governed by perspective mm -hmm. and your perspective is so powerful it will govern your entire life but a little tweak to your perspective will change the way you walk through your entire day mm-hmm 
Is that? Yeah. Did, did, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. But no, is that's that, is, really good. That's you feel thing, like that's what you were talking about, kind of. Something I also learned um, along my life journey is like, like life's going to deal you certain things, right? Mm -hmm. Like for you, life dealt you one hand and and, and an arm that doesn't have a hand, mm -hmm. right? But so, and you don't have really a choice in that, right? However, you do have a choice in what context you're going to put that in. Mm -hmm. And you kind of told us already today, you're like, well, you could either cry about it your entire life and call yourself, you know, less fortunate, or you can say, well, this is like my superpower, you know, like because of, because of this, I've become a different person, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, it sounds like that's one of the main reasons why you got that Expanse gig, right? You know, I can't take as much credit as you're giving me. I was just, I've always had one hand. Uh -huh. I can't, I can't imagine life any differently. I don't know how you live. How do you live with two hands? You have two of them? Jeez, that seems like a burden. I mean, like, like, I, I guess, I don't know. I have, I've had a very privileged life in okay. so many other ways that mm -hmm. I can't really claim hardship i've grown up in such a supportive house i grew up in a household that was supportive of me being disabled and gay like that is a wow. lottery that is a lottery <laughs> ticket right there <clears throat> because i could have been an axe murderer but i was I, I had an environment that told me like yeah this is yeah wait wait no there's no reason to be upset this is who you are you're fine and you're beautiful and i i, I never felt unnormal that's great. Because I, I, I've always, I've always had one hand. Like this is, I don't know. Yeah. Just. Well, I, again, I, we get dealt. I mean, we get dealt a certain deck of cards, right? Yeah. This, you can call if you since you're a Buddhist, we can just say that's your karma, right? Yeah. You know, and you could say, well, that's because I did all this stuff in this past life, and now I'm reaping the rewards and the punishment for that, or however you want to think of it. But mm -hmm. in the end, it's like you get dealt a certain set of cards. But like an expert poker player gets dealt a certain set of cards, but somehow that person wins tens of thousands of dollars and another poker player doesn't, even they're all getting dealt the same cards in the audience. Right. You know? But the expert poker player who gets a bad hand doesn't go, oh no, oh. Oh, my life. I'm suffering. I'm so, this is terrible. My life sucks. Everyone sucks. Why, why, why? An expert poker player with a bad hand goes, oh, I've got a bad hand. Well, I better not show anything so my opponent doesn't know. <laughs> you right. know, like, so that, that, that's all it is. I mean, Buddhism is only a half fix. Like, Buddhism says life is suffering. Yeah, mm -hmm. like this this is a life of suffering. This is a world you will suffer. It doesn't matter how avoidant to conflict you are, you cannot escape it. And it will happen here. Now, the trick the, that the thing Buddhism is is I mean that's only half of it. There's suffering, but then there's also an equal amount of pleasure. Well, there is pleasure. There right. sure, it's yeah, back and Ple forth. Pleasure is unavoidable too, but we don't have a problem with pleasure. We have a problem with it's suffering. suffering part, yeah. So all Buddhism does is say, this is a logistical met like series of mental tricks that help you realize that suffering is unavoidable, but you don't have to let the suffering make you unhappy. And right. Right. It is just a lifelong exercise of choosing to be as content as you can with a life of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> so, and 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 it takes the sting away. It takes away okay. the power. It, you, it, I don't know. Everyone yeah, can disagree. Yeah, I mean, with you. okay, that, that's it's what still Buddhism gives to me. In the yeah. end, you realize it's all a mind trick. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the end, the real reality is that we are pure awareness i mean if you deep dig deep into the human being when you take away all the layers what is in the bottom what's left is pure awareness pure silence and out of the silence is love mm -hmm. and then also the sound of om 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's oneness with every. You are a part of everything. You're yeah, doing the thing you were meant to do. You were a right. Your your painful experience is a part of the whole. It's it's yeah. what's so supposed it's part to of being a a, a a creature on planet Earth. Yeah, you know, like right this now, I'm deal. sitting on my chair, and now my butt's starting to hurt because we've been going for like t- two hours. Yeah, <laughs> but, you but know, you it doesn't would... bother me that much because we're talking about very interesting things. <laughs> I mean, on some kind of subtextual level, you agreed to be here. Yeah. So this is the deal. This is what you signed up for. Yeah, mm-hmm. it hurts, but it's like it doesn't hurt if you realize that you signed up for it. I don't like mm-hmm. this is the it's it's it it's a mind fuck and it's not a mind fuck. It's a trick and it's not a trick, but like yeah, like I don't know. It when you take away some of the ego, when you take away some of the I am so important, I deserve to not suffer, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, then if you take away some of that, then you realize, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm do- I'm like I'm I'm here for 90 years and I'm in the mosh pit and I'm throwing elbows. Let's do it. Let's suffer. Let's suffer yeah. for 90 years and like Fucking experience it and make a story. Let's have a life. Let's suffer. <laughs> like, right. like that. That's you know, like that. That that's what it is for me. And if everyone yeah. disagrees with me, I don't blame you. Well, okay. So why would somebody want to go watch a show like The Expanse when there's all kinds of suffering going on in that show all the time, all kinds of crap going on? But people love the show. They really enjoy it. it right there. That's a perfect example. You know? Because the expanse is an extremely diverse show. Like the expanse is very inclusive um, with with race, ability, um, sexuality. It it it, 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 it really all. it really brings everyone besides just the white experience into the American mainstream media, and then it heightens the lack of resources. Mm-hmm. So. You know, like it, it just takes the human experience and it heightens the strain of the lack of resources pushing up against everyone's body chemistry. So right. it is an like, I don't know, the extra the, the expanse to me is an exercise in suffering because it heightens the current supply chain crisis. Mm-hmm. To also, a it, it's amount. Not, it doesn't really show you good and evil. It just yeah. shows you different perspectives. I mean, like we're all just yeah. You know, some people really identify with the Belters. Some people really identify with the Martians. There's probably some people that identify with the Earthers, even though in the Expanse the Earthers are kind of the dorks. You know, yeah. But- <laughs> the Earthers are the fucking babies. They're the fucking marshmallow. Yeah. Like cre- Eric. Eric is a cream puff. Like he lives on the 80th floor of a skyscraper with motorcycles that he never rides. Like, yes. Yeah. Earth is what Earth people born on Earth are the trust fund babies that Martians and Belters hate. They are like, yeah. fuck you. Even if you're a poor, <laughs> even if you're a poor person on Earth, you have won the GD lottery. And maybe that's kind of like what it's like to be even a lower class person in the U.S. right now. It's at least like you are you are the motor is broken on the window in your car door poor. You're not you're not I can't get bread poor like, you know, so um, that's what's beautiful about the expanse. Everyone. No one is a bad guy. Well, some people are bad guys, but everyone is just trying to make it. And there's yeah. something beautiful about that because that's what, that's what the world is. That's what life is. It's, yeah. it, 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 it's a non guilty. It's a non guilty portrait of the fact that you're a beautiful, innocent creature trapped in a body that has to struggle to take resources for themselves to continue living. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. On that okay. note, <laughs> let's let's pick this up it. later. All right. So you know how I, now I know that you know how to do this, right? Hmm. So yeah, yeah, like this, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can. You can. It's do like this. Yeah, I'm doing it. Can't you sit? Can't you tell? Actually, that Hold looks up. a little bit Hold like on. a doggy. <laughs> there you go. I'm doing it now. All right.
There, I'll take that. So, Mr. Jacob, they can long and prosper. Now, this is really funny because remember, I promised to you that we would only go for an hour. No, but I, that was me. <laughs> and I, I just, because a lot, okay, thank you, Matt, so much. A lot of people ask me to do their podcasts and I, I, I'm at a point where I have to protect myself from overcommitment to things and this just turned into a lot of fun. So thank you for respecting my boundaries and then thank you for being really cool and worthwhile because I'm I, I'm more than happy to spend the time that we did. Yeah, it was great. Okay, so I'll tell you what we'll do. Okay. I'll just pay you the normal fee for the first hour and then I'll give you like golden time for after that. <laughs> you didn't, there's no fee. You didn't say, there's no contract. You're not going to pay me for this. Uh, that's true. Do you but pay your guests? Fee, if there was Do you pay fee, your guests? Actually, I have to admit that there was one guest that I did pay. I had to pay Tim Rust, but that was part of the deal. Yeah, of course you but, did. But I mean, you He's know. He's Tim it, Rust. <laughs> yeah, but he okay. didn't charge me an arm and a leg. I didn't really have to pay him that much. I can't but, pay an arm and a leg. But uh, we could, now that, uh, well, we could renegotiate the contract <laughs> if you do want a fee. I do actually pay my actors mm -hmm. for my show. Mm -hmm. But it's not a lot. I mean, like we for a, a one to two hour green screen session over Zoom, which is how I usually do it, they get a hundred bucks. I have so. never been paid to do a podcast. I didn't get paid for tying that guy. So no, no. Okay. Thank you. You're beautiful. I love you, but fuck you. You're not paying me money. You're beautiful too, and I love you even more. <laughs> this is this is this is a lot of fun. And yeah. And also, it was like a slight business transaction, so I could plug other stuff that I'm doing. Like we're there, you all, go. All, you know, you know how with it, how it is. It, of course. <laughs> okay, all right, wait. live long how and much prosper, longer we sir. Okay. Can and I now... do some plugs real quick? Can I do? A oh, couple of course. Plugs? Yeah. Um, I have a, a few fans out in the world, and if you love me and want to see what I'm up to, um, February 24th in Nashville. I'm going to be at the Third Coast Comedy Club and I'm going to do a stand-up comedy set. Oh, cool. So if I I would love for you to come see me if you want to come see my Eric do stand-up comedy. Um, uh, I'll be in Nashville on the 24th of this month, February. And um, also a couple, like last week, um, I dropped an episode of Young Rock. I'm on NBC's Young Rock. Season 3, <laughs> episode 10. Season 3, episode 10, you can check me out. It's a very standard sitcom-y, very, like, network-y sitcom kind of a episode. It's not. It's nothing like Eric or The Expanse, but if you're curious, you can check it out. Okay. And, um, yeah, maybe I'll come back later. We'll talk about... If you're if you live in Chicago in October, my one man play is going to be produced by Theater Evolve, and it's going to be at the Edge Theater on Broadway. So, I uh, can't wait to see you all there. And thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you for loving me, and thank you for loving Matt. And okay, I we're hope... putting links to all those things in the description. Mm -hmm. Besides any other links to any of your social media or anything else you want down there, it'll mm -hmm. all be down there. So, guys, just click on it and. Do go to all of Jacob's stuff, share and like this video, of course. All of that. And tweet and us more. and so on. And all right. tweet us and share. All right, sir. Till we meet again. Dun, 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 dun. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We gotta change.